I want to thank you very much for coming on this gorgeous spring day in the Philadelphia area. Um, I'm sure there are people out on the tennis courts and probably Frisbee and, and Sheehan Beach, of course. There are probably a few students out there. Um, let me just tell you just a, a tiny bit about the Ryan Center because we also have the Junior Ryan Fellows Program um, and Leanne Cottrell. Leanne, if you wouldn't mind standing up for a minute so folks can... If, you're, if that's something you're interested in, you should talk with Leanne. It's a group of students. Um, there are brochures here about the Ryan Center. You can read about it. But if you're interested in our mission and our initiatives, um, we bring in visiting scholars and fellows, um, uh, provide lectures and, and conferences, the Ryan Junior Fellows Program. There's also a Franklin Reading Group. Um, and we try to do special things for the students to make sure that they're um, getting everything possible out of their intellectual experience here at Villanova. So if you're interested, please talk to Leanne. Um, we'd love to work with you and, and invite you to um, all of our events as well as some special things that are designed just for the students. Uh, today we are very fortunate to have as our guest speaker Dr. William Allen who in fact is this year the uh, visiting senior scholar at the Ryan Center. He's currently teaching for us a graduate class on Montesquieu in America, advising a, a thesis for one of our graduate students, uh, Clyde Ray, that I've had the pleasure to read lately. Um, and um, generally uh, pursuing his research, which is very extensive. Dr. Allen is Emeritus Professor of Political Philosophy in the Political Science Department at Michigan State University. Uh, he has also been uh, previously on the National Council for the uh, Humanities and is a member and ultimately chairman of the United States Civil Rights Commission. I don't know if you're familiar with that commission, but it's uh, an eight-member uh, board that looks at all the civil rights issues uh, in the United States. Very, very important board, and um, we were very fortunate to have Dr. Allen serve on that for quite a number of years. He was most recently the Ann and Herbert W. Vaughn Visiting Fellow in the James Madison program uh, in American I Ideals and Institutions at Princeton University. Dr. Allen has published extensively, including uh, a book entitled George Washington, A Collection. Uh, in 2008, a new book appeared, which is the subject of his talk today, George Washington, America's First Progressive. And we'll have to let him uh, tell us what that title could possibly mean. He's also published The Personal and the Political, Three Fables by Montesquieu, uh, a new book that's out just recently, I believe it was in February, Rethinking Uncle Tom, The Political Philosophy of Harriet Beecher Stowe, and absolutely uh, a book that you won't forget when you read it. It's a book you'll want to think about um, for a long time afterwards. He's also published with his wife, Carol Allen, uh, Habits of Mind, Fostering Access and Excellence in Higher Education, and The Anti-Federalist with Gordon Lloyd, and finally, The Federalist Papers, A Commentary. Well, not finally. He's right now working on a translation of Montesquieu's Spirit of the Laws and a commentary on that. Please join me in welcoming Dr. William Allen. Thank you so much, and thank uh, Dr. Sheehan for that introduction. The conversation at some length, I, I trust. I do want to uh, deliver some remarks on the theme question, of course, but uh, I hope I can keep them sufficiently brief that this can be more conversation than monologue. Uh, I should say by way of preface that I'm grateful to the Junior Ryan Fellows who are here because they have been good enough already to listen to a preview of this particular set of remarks. And they are brave to come back for a reprise. And I will try to make it worth their while. Uh, also, let me say by way of preface that this is now April, already mid-April, of this time that I've been spending at Villanova. And I can scarcely believe the time has gone so rapidly. 
Uh, I was informed not long ago that I only have a couple of classes left in this semester, uh, something about which I protested, but I didn't hear any of the students protesting very loudly. <laughs> it has been a wonderful year. I, I want to say that you are marvelous host, and it has been my special pleasure to spend this time with you. I shall certainly remember it for a long time to come. But yes, I do want to talk about George Washington, America's First Progressive. And that means this book, which appeared last August and is still available. And also, I want to talk about, in the context of that, the book which is the occasion of the new book. And that is the book that was published now 20 years ago, George Washington, A Collection. Uh, this was the one volume collection of Washington's writings that I prepared and published in 1988 and which, as you will see in my remarks, constitutes essentially the foundation for the essays in George Washington America's First Progressive. A very important question in our country is the question of retention of our memory. It is fair to say that we do too little of that and that we've been as a country rather undisciplined in the way we go about it. And I'm quite certain that there's no way to accomplish the task quite so well as to engage those who teach, for example, the young in the process of taking the task seriously and passing on that torch to others who will eventually take our places. And that is how I think of the students in my classroom and for those of you here who teach in your classrooms. I realize, of course, that those students are diverse and that they're going to do many things. But I'm also certain that there is in every one of your classrooms someone who is especially gifted and who will accept the responsibility to preserve our country's heritage and to preserve its memory. So what we're about largely is to make certain that the memory continues to live. And I do that, of course, in many ways, but I believe none more importantly than in making the memory of George Washington live. The waxen character to whom I was introduced as a boy is not the George Washington whom you now get to know. And it is really important in this country that everyone as far as possible will come to understand George Washington, the man, and not George Washington, the wax figure, to see that this country did not happen by accident and that it required the singular blessing of providence, highlighting the distinguished talent of a particular individual to make it possible. That is why we do this work. And there's one of the aspects of Uncle Tom's Cabin that highlights the importance of this. In my re most recent book, the one that appeared in mid-February, Rethinking Uncle Tom, which you can get from Lexington Books, by the way. <laughs> and in the course of telling the story of Harriet Beecher Stowe and of Uncle Tom, I also take the occasion to note the description of the portrait of George Washington that hangs in Uncle Tom's cabin at the beginning of the novel. Stowe described the Washington portrait as being interestingly colored, which I take to be an interesting phrase. <laughs> it is, of course, part of the dynamic of that novel to raise the question of America's heritage and to whom the heritage speaks. That is encapsulated in that little touch in the novel, which is Stowe's way of saying that George Washington is not the founder of a narrow, sectarian, parochial country, but of a cosmopolitan regime, one that opens the door to humanity insofar as humanity can come to enjoy the blessing of being American. That is what I want to spend a few minutes discussing with you. As indicated in the introduction I published last summer, this work uh, calling George Washington America's first progressive, which is of course available from Peter Lang Incorporated. <laughs> I wrote this book for a very particular reason. This is a book of my interpretation and analysis of George Washington's contribution. It is, in effect, the book that explains the collection of Washington's writings, why I made the choices I made, what I envisioned the effect of reading these writings of Washington to be.
That is to say, I believe the collection reveals the real Washington and gives us the opportunity to engage Washington thinking, doing so in the manner that led to the formulation of the principles and the direction of this nation. When George Washington enunciated in 1783 the project of establishing a national character, I believe he therein defined the work of American citizenship and what America is meant to be in a way that exceeds the contribution, any contribution, that we've received from any of the founding generation. I'm not at all shy to tell you that I consider Washington to be the most important of the founders. Uh, that causes some disturbance in some quarters. <laughs> he was not a mere symbol, as often represented in some of the biographies and histories, but in fact, the creative source, the very genius that made the founding possible. I came to that discovery by accident. It is my goal to make that no longer necessary to be an accidental discovery. To allow everyone to come to that discovery through ordinary study. The accident that characterized my discovery occurred in the following way. I teach primary sources. I believe that teaching at all levels never succeeds so well as it does when it introduces students to primary sources. They bring a vitality, an immediacy, and the opportunity for imaginative transposition that makes lessons stick. Once, therefore, with teaching the origin of political parties in the United States at Harvey Mudd College and Claremont Graduate School, where I taught for most of my career, I turned to the annals of Congress, the correspondence of the participants in those critical debates in the era from 1789 through 1800, the particular addresses, uh, state papers, and other such things that create the context in which and out of which the necessity of political parties emerged. Naturally, I included works by George Washington merely because using primary sources, I wanted to be comprehensive I wanted that not only for comprehensiveness, but, because, but also not because I had any particular expectation that I should discover something new there. I thought that doing so would help establish the background against which we would discover what Thomas Jefferson and James Madison on the one side and Alexander Hamilton on the other side were actually working on, what they really understood. In the course of reading Washington, I was stopped in my tracks. I found myself in the grip of an extraordinary intelligence, which did not fit any of the caricatures I had learned over the course of years when reading from secondary sources. Someone who was not at all educated, I had come to understand. Someone who, yes, bestrode a horse most gracefully, and who became a symbol for his country because of his military presence, but who had nothing to say concerning those deep philosophical and moral principles that led to the foundation and formation of self-government. I found exactly the opposite. Someone who said every important thing first, not second. And someone who articulated it with true eloquence, not bumbling, stumbling, uneducated. I was so where this came from and what it amounted to. And when I say everything, that was my second accidental discovery. We are accustomed to thinking of some founders as profound writers and thinkers. And we resort to them because we think they have created most of the material in which we will discover the story of our founding. So we want to read the papers of Thomas Jefferson, of James Madison, of Alexander Hamilton, of Benjamin Franklin, of John Adams, and so on. I discovered in an incomplete collection of Washington's writings published in 1939, there were 39 volumes, not of letters to him, but only of his writings. I ask you to reflect on that concept. What does it require? to produce 39 volumes.
however they are written. <laughs> that is a great deal of writing. That is a great deal of thinking. Even in a typewriter or a computer age, let alone in the 18th century. Moreover, that is not the end of the story. For the Fitzpatrick edition of 1939 is incomplete. The University of Virginia, led mainly by W.W. W. Abbott and Dorothy Tuig, advanced the project of collecting, collecting and publishing Washington's works. Now that process, which is still ongoing, has already reached 100 volumes. That is a great deal of material for someone who did not know how to write or think or speak. Thus, I discovered that here was something that we needed to know from the inside out, rather than simply borrowed interpretations. The volume was produced accordingly, and as I began to make the selections of things to place in a single volume that would be accessible, my purpose was straightforward. It was not to tell the story of his life. It was not to say that here was an illustration of the things that Washington produced, a random sample. It was rather to convey the kinds of documents that would most surely force one to ask a single question about George Washington. How did he know all this? And you will discover one point in reading of these documents where that becomes an urgent inquiry and not just an idle intellectual curiosity. And that is in the farewell address. You've likely read the farewell address before. I urge you to do so again. This time, I want you to pay attention to a single passage in which Washington declared that he had been engaged in the work that he was now putting down. It was a retirement address after all. He'd been engaged in this work for 45 years. This was published to the country in 1796. Washington said it. But I did what apparently never occurred to anyone previously, namely simple arithmetic. 45 years prior to 1796 takes us to 1751. This takes us to a point prior to Washington's becoming commander of the Virginia militia, though he was assiduously lobbying for the post at that time. The then president, 1796, claimed that he had been laboring ever since 1751 to create the very nation that he was now declaring in his farewell to have successfully created. That is an enormous claim. A 19-year-old youngster, thus informed, thus purposive. Should we believe it? This is a mind-bending claim that exceeds the scope of our ordinary imagination of the possibilities of human ambition. But we must take it seriously because he said it. Moreover, he did not say that only then, but he repeated it in subsequent correspondence with such as Jonathan Trumbull. This must mean at least that we are not so much in the presence of a man with wooden teeth as in the presence of a Lycurgus or a Moses, those human beings of such extraordinary stature that we continue long after to discuss the dimensions of their labors in behalf of human happiness. Does Washington live up to the claim? We must be skeptical, and we must interrogate it. The writings constitute the venue of the interrogation, for there we find him expressing the goals prescribing the methods, identifying the circumstances to be overcome, and projecting the labors required to achieve the creation of a self-governing society. We see in him the affirmation of a confidence in human beings, human nature itself. And we see him appeal to the guidance of divine providence. All this is present in his writings. And we have now risen to a point beyond the personality conflicts between the Adamses and Jeffersons to a level at which we contemplate someone who purports to bring from Sinai the tablets upon, upon which we find the tablets upon which we find inscribed our fate. <laughs>
because that is what we behold in Washington. I structured the collected writings to serve as introduction to that immense project. They were built around a theme, and that theme accounts for the title of my more recent work, George Washington, America's First Progressive. I expect people to wonder, or even perhaps to doubt, what I meant by calling Washington a progressive. We all know that term is fraught with narrow connotations contemporarily. Therefore, I seem to be running the risk of enlisting Washington as a partisan in certain kinds of political efforts that might seem questionable to some of you, desirable to others. But I wish hurriedly to disabuse any such misconceptions. I have not identified Washington as one of those 20th century Johnny-come-latelys who embraced the term progressive while rejecting the foundations of the country and leading the country astray. What I mean to say in the title is that we find in Washington the true definition of progressivism, the one that defines America properly. The definition is not freighted with Woodrow Wilson's racism and other forms of political snobbery, the kind that characterized 19th and 20th century progressivism. Permit me, therefore, to read just a few passages from the book, illustrative of Washington's project and of the definition. The book itself is a series of chapters discussing various aspects of Washington's leadership and statesmanship. And, and what they do, these chapters, is to tease apart such subjects as Washington as a believer, Washington and slavery, Washington's generalship, etc. Thus, the book is thematic. But in the course of discussing the themes, I make observations about what the book is about. And in the following passage in the preface, I say this, creating a nation dedicated to and capable of sustaining religious liberty, he pursued a complete and lofty design for a just city by means of a relentlessly pragmatic initiative such as his plan to connect the Potomac and Ohio rivers. It would be difficult for anyone who took Washington seriously not to rediscover through exposure to his thoughts and deeds an impulse towards liberalism properly understood. Washington's definition of progressivism was provided in a 1786 letter to Lafayette, which laid out the terms of progressivism which remain to this day the most comprehensive and articulate conception of the purpose of America. And I quote, as a member of an infant empire, as a philanthropist by character, and if I may be allowed the expression, as a citizen of the great republic of humanity at large, I wish the president had quoted this rather than quoting Paine and calling it Washington, but I continue. I cannot avoid reflecting with pleasure on the probable influence that commerce will hereafter have on human manners and society in general. On these occasions, I consider how mankind may be connected like one great family in fraternal ties. I indulge a fond, perhaps an enthusiastic idea that as the world is evidently much less barbarous than it has been, its melioration must still be progressive. That nations are becoming more humanized in their policy. That the subjects of ambition and causes for hostility are daily diminishing. And in fine, that the period is not very remote when the benefits of a liberal and free commerce will pretty generally succeed to the devastations and horrors of war. We cannot find a more enthusiastic and hopeful account of progressivism at any period of our history since that time. Another passage, and this involves an analysis or at least an interpretation of the circular address of 1783, in which Washington himself called as he resigned his uh, or which Washington himself called as he resigned his military command, his political legacy. It reads as follows, what then is the teaching of the circular address? Washington described it as affording delight to the benevolent and liberal mind, whether viewed in a natural, a political, or moral point of light. Why? The situation was such that the American people enjoyed a vast tract of continent 
ensuring all the necessaries and conveniences of life and possessing absolute freedom and independency. In short, Americans lack nothing of what could be called the ordinary incidents or conditions of prosperity. They did, however, lack the one extraordinary condition for the full exploitation of these blessings, namely political happiness. And, and let me say by way of digression and parenthesis that I explain the meaning of these terms, political happiness, political prosperity, in my book, The Federalist Papers, A Commentary. So I will not enter into that long discussion now. But I continue. They did, however, lack the one extraordinary condition for the full exploitation of these blessings, namely political happiness. Washington conveyed this bad news in a characteristically positive fashion. He said that heaven left them the opportunity for political happiness. The notion of an opportunity for political happiness was not mere rhetorical gloss, however. For Washington meant by it also the availability of those distinctive conditions and instruments for the attainment of the end. Added to the material conditions of American life were those treasures of knowledge, his words, which had superseded the gloomy age of ignorance and superstition and provided specific tools to establish forms of government. The tools, the free cultivation of letters, the unbounded extension of commerce, the progressive refinement of manners, the growing liberality of sentiment, and above all, the benign and pure light of revelation. With such tools, Washington urged, a people can fashion their freedom and their happiness. Indeed, no external obstacles impede them. One might ask why, with such blessings, this remains a time of political probation, as he called it, for Americans. The answer, according to Washington, was they had not yet applied the tools available to them to give themselves a national character, a regime. He did not fail, therefore, to recommend immediate steps to that end. And I will quote again. First, an indissoluble union of the states under one federal head. Second, a sacred regard to public justice. Third, adoption of a proper peace establishment. And fourth, the prevalence of that pacific and friendly disposition among the people of the United States, which would induce them to forget their local prejudices and policies to make those mutual concessions which are requisite to the general prosperity and in some instances to sacrifice their individual advantages to the interest of the community. Close quotation. It would not defy common sense to see how differently the fourth recommendation is stated in comparison to the first three. It is still more important to reflect on its significance since Washington himself expressly omitted to dilate on it, as he said, leaving the last to the good sense and serious consideration of those immediately concerned. He did dilate on its accomplishment in the farewell address 13 years later. There he could conclude that now the unity of government which constitutes you one people is dear to you. Americans had supplemented their love of liberty with the love of being one people. The former, the love of liberty, is the foundation of the free society. But the latter, the love of being one people, is the means of preserving it against foreign and domestic assault. The love of being one people is above all the cause of the people's political safety and prosperity. The people had come to vaunt their particularism. That is the American narrative. And thus, they gave assurance to individual liberty. For all those people who take exception to American exceptionalism, American particularism, what they attack is the very thing that George Washington said was key to making progressive freedom work. The Americans had to understand themselves as one people, defined by their love of liberty, in order to preserve liberty and the opportunity for self-government. 
Washington goes on subsequently, and in chapter four of George Washington, America's First Progressive, which is George Washington the Thinker, I write the following. Washington was the American who defined progressivism and provided the rationale for its constitutional basis in a vision of self-government. As we saw in the letter to Lafayette of 1786, he laid out the terms of progressivism which remain to this day the most comprehensive and articulate conception of the purpose of America. And that term for Washington was a way to explain the meaning of liberalism. If we look to its origin in the Latin, liberalis, meaning suitable for a freeman, we immediately can see one reason why liberal philosophy appealed to many of the thinkers in the 13 colonies. The Oxford English Dictionary gave this as its fifth meaning for the term liberal, favorable to constitutional changes and legal or administrative reforms tending in the direction of freedom or democracy. The third meaning, free from restraint, free in speech or action, is also relevant in this context. Franklin, Jefferson, Madison, Washington, and many of their contemporaries believed that the liberty they held so dear was not a vacation from restraint, but a duty to govern. They understood freedom as inextricably bound to duty, the duty to govern self, and the duty to abide by the laws developed by a self-governing people. And one last passage from the chapter, Washington, Slaveholder and Liberator, which, by the way, I will say, uh, a digression perhaps, but is the chapter in which I put to term all doubt about Washington's attitude towards slavery. But there isn't time to investigate that presently. So I go on. At the founding of the United States, Hector Saint-Jean de Crevecoeur visited and penned what became the model of the phrase, the melting pot. Very early, an ideal existed in the United States of peoples from diverse societies uniting their energies in a cauldron of political and moral creativity and bringing forth a new model, what Ronald Reagan loved to call the new man. Krepke's idealism was not unfounded. It found expression in many of the public utterances and writings of America's leaders. And toward the end of the struggle with Britain, with only a definitive peace treaty still pending, George Washington gave voice to this idealism in his general orders to the troops in April, on April 18th, in fact, in 1783. And I will quote him. For happy, thrice happy, shall they be pronounced hereafter, who have contributed anything, who have performed the meanest office in erecting this stupendous fabric of freedom and empire on the broad basis of independence, who have assisted in protecting the rights of humane nature and establishing an asylum for the poor and the oppressed of all nations and religions. Close quotation. These general orders were as much policy statements as exhortations to the faithful. Nor can we mistake their meaning. The rights of humane nature bore a necessary relation to the needs of the poor and the oppressed of all nations and religions. While equality, as an intellectual concept, had no special relationship to ideas of oppression and want, it is nevertheless certain that the American discussion of equality grows out of a disposition to lift up the poor and oppressed of all nations and religions. What is perhaps striking is to see George Washington as the author of that progressive disposition. In order for America to serve as asylum for so great a range of political and religious differences, it would have to be in some fashion a melting pot, an agglomeration of social possibilities. In those terms, equality does not celebrate or preserve cultural origins but rises above them in pursuit of something far better. Now, that provides a summation of the thrust of Washington's efforts as an initiative on behalf of a progressive agenda and which lay at the heart of his founding work. While I could read many more passages, such as the 1777 letter, for example, setting forth the criteria for building a free constitution, 
or I could describe further initiatives of political bearing even while commanding the military and to show how he sets forth the ideal of the rule by the true fountain of all authority, namely the people, subsequently followed by all the members of the founding generation. If it all come to the same thing, this is what defines America. It came to be, America did, because of his labors bent to this end. The instruments that were created to realize the end are justified in these terms and for these purposes. And so, I would ask you, is it so hard to think of George Washington as a progressive? Villanova, we have a tradition, or at least we will have a tradition, uh, since the Ryan Center is fairly new, of, of course, taking questions from the audience, and all of you are encouraged to ask questions, but to privilege the students. The Ryan Center wants to put the students first. So um, we'd like to begin with any questions from students. I'll let you take the questions. Okay, great. And we'll be patient. <laughs> yes, sir. <laughs> First of all, thank you for a really, brilliant lecture. And, and, and yes, I think we can consider Washington. <laughs> Let me ask you, if all we knew about Washington was what we wrote in the 1750s, how much of this do you find in that very early period? Uh, that's an excellent and question. And if you would summarize the, I will, the question, yes. Nelson. That's yes. Uh, the, the question, just to be sure that we can all uh, follow, is was any of this evident in the early stages of Washington's expressions, his writings, or records of things he thought or said in the 1750s, since he refers us back to that time? A critically important question. The answer is partly yes and partly no. Uh, partly yes, when we begin to look at what Washington did create by the way of a record for himself while operating in the colonial militia we see the characteristic forms of expression that will mature later into the affirmations of American nationality, the kinds of attention that he shows to the troops, uh, the, the fact that he wins their complete loyalty so thoroughly and does it on the basis of general principles that he enunciates. All of this foreshadows wh what is to come later. But there are no express deliberations about the meaning of self-government about the meaning of liberalism or progressivism. That has all got to be reconsidered as implicit, somehow perhaps buried in the breast of a youthful ambition, but not expressed openly. But remember, when Washington finally becomes so exasperated with British policy that would lead any British officer with a royal commission to command any colonial officer no matter what rank, and thus a colonial colonel could be ordered about by a lieutenant with a royal commission, Washington went so far as to travel all the way to Boston and to present himself before Governor Shirley to demand some way of rectifying this rank injustice. That is, from the beginning, he, he reacted strongly to the least appearances of injustice and quickly came to question the foundations of the American relationship with the British Empire. So it was no accident in 1764 already that he becomes the first American to speak of taking up arms. And he does this in a letter to his colleague and friend George Mason when they're still deliberating the kinds of issues that are only beginning to percolate in the struggle with Britain. The, the war, the Seven Years' War, had only just ended, so the struggle about how the parliament might tax the colonies was all very new, and they were reacting to it. He's already talking about this as such an urgency that we may have to resort to taking up arms. So that we find clearly in early on in Washington a tendency 
to see the relationship with Britain through eyes that envision difference, that would see Washington himself and therefore Washington's nation as something different than Britain. And in fact, the one example that I like best that really prefigures it all, again comes in early 60s, not in the 50s, but close enough, when he's recently married uh, Martha Custis. And Martha Custis had a British uncle who had been consistently a correspondent of hers, particularly during her widowhood, during those critical years. But after the marriage, he ceased to write to her. So George Washington wrote a letter to this uncle and said, in effect, if, you know, your niece hasn't heard from you in a long time. And we're, we're afraid that perhaps we've done something that may have offended you or discouraged you, your writing. And, and so I would really like to give you the news of our family and invite you to renew your correspondence with her. This took maybe a three quarters of a page. Then he went on for another five pages, roughly, excoriating the British Parliament. <laughs> And, and effectively saying to this uncle whom he had never addressed before in his life, can't you do something? <laughs> so, so I think we see his bearing. It takes shape and begins to take the form of public expression very surely without ever a step to the side or backwards in this process. So, so whatever the youthful ambition was, it probably contributed to his way of doing business thereafter. Yes. Oh, I have a student, oh, okay. professor. Yes. Um, in his own address, George Washington talked kind of about like virtue and divine will. So if you saw America kind of as like transcending the religion and culture, like we're talking about, do you think he still saw like the character of the government as kind of like a religious sort? Another excellent question. Uh, did Washington prefigure? a secular regime in which religion would become of secondary importance. Now, uh, this is a question which is difficult for us because we've become somewhat confused about these terms in our time. So, so let me try slowly to disentangle them in Washington's universe. Uh, Washington frequently attributed the uh, blessing of liberty and independence to divine providence and spoke easily and casually about the authority of God in human affairs. And of course, he reminds us in the farewell that anyone who would imagine the possibility of sustaining a self-governing society without the authority of morality and religion would be imagining what never was and never could be. Those are the terms he used to describe that. So Washington always made clear that he thought religion was exceedingly important. But that only raises the question, well, you know, there's no such thing as religion in general, right? There are only particular religions. So, so what could he be talking about? Did he mean Christianity? Well, of course, he certainly was a Christian himself, and he even invoked Christianity at the same time as he so frequently pledged liberty, not mere tolerance, as he said in the letter to the Hebrew congregation at Newport, not by mere tolerance do we can you practice your faith here? But on the strong foundation of liberty, can you practice your faith here? He went out of his way to assure Muslims that there was no indisposition to the presence of Muslims in the American community. So, so, so what was he trying to convey? Why did he open up in 1783 the door to all religions? I have to believe it's something like the following. And, and this was partially conveyed in the first inaugural address, where he tells us that, of course, national happiness, but what they're now setting about to accomplish, is utterly dependent upon private morality. So, so that Washington was conveying two separate teachings each time he talked about this, and even if he formulated them separately. One teaching was that the morality comes first. It is the morality, the moral principle, the strength of the moral commitment that makes it possible to create the free society and which is required to sustain the free society. So we can see him making very clear 
that religion has a role to play in making this society possible in the first place, that it is the Christian religion he conveys in the circular address in 1783. And this is not as an official religion, because morality comes first and then the state. But the state is a free state that welcomes all religions. You must always remember, that is the formulation that he used. In 1783, in that address, from which I read the four provisions for establishing a society, there is a closing section in which he invokes, uh, shall we say, divine sanction for this work. But the way in which he invokes that divine sanction is very particular. And perhaps I should read it to you just to be very, very clear at this moment so we do not in any way misconstrue what he's telling us. He says, to, to, and this letter is sent to all the, thir the governors of all the 13 states, so it was meant to be a broad public document. And so he closes it the following way. I now make it my earnest prayer that God would have you and the state over which you preside in his holy protection, that he would incline the hearts of the citizens to cultivate a spirit of subordination and obedience to government, to entertain a brotherly affection and love for one another, for their fellow citizens of the United States at large, and particularly for their brethren who have served in the field. And finally, that he would be most graciously pleased to dispose us all to do justice, to love mercy, and to demean ourselves with that charity, humility, and pacific temper of mind, which were the characteristics of the divine author of our blessed religion, and without an humble imitation of whose example in these things, we can never hope to be a happy nation. Now, I have to call your attention to what is happening there, right? Uh, you probably, many of you at least, recognize that he's quoting from Micah 6 8. That what does God ask of man but to do justly, to love mercy, and walk humbly with his God? That's Micah 6 8. Clearly, this is a quotation, though not identified as such, by George Washington. But we also then, when we notice that he's quoting Micah 6 8, have to observe that he changes it. He doesn't say walk humbly with his God. He says he wants him to provide us with that uh, humility and pacific temper of mind which are the characteristics of the divine author of our blessed religion without an humble imitation of whose example. Now this is walking humbly in one sense, but it's also an imitatio dei, it's imitation of God. This is ambitious. He, he wants them to rise to the standard of Christ himself. So he invokes the example of Christ that the people ought to imitate in order to attain this pacific and friendly disposition, which we've already seen laid out in the very definition of progressivism. So what is it that makes it possible to talk about admitting every religion? A cultivated attitude inspired by religious faith that leads to a pacific and friendly disposition towards them all. That is what Washington is recommending throughout. Not abandoning religion, not religious freedom to mean freedom from religion, but a religious freedom that permits the fullest working of a religious principle unencumbered by the weight of public authority. Yes, Professor, here, and then we'll come back there. Um, I actually was just hoping to talk a little bit more about freedom being inextricably, inextricably bound to duty. Um, because I, I think that those two ideas have been sort of unhinged from one another uh, in our modern orientation towards us. Yeah, the, the question is. Um, what does he really mean by freedom inextricably bound to duty? And, and is it possible that that's become unhinged in our time? And, and I concur that we don't have the same reflex that Washington had. We, we never, when we hear freedom, think first of what burdens we have to carry. <laughs> we, we, we tend first to think of what enjoyments we shall reap <laughs> when we hear the word freedom. So. The way to convey that, it seems to me, is to remember what Washington means when he says of the people, this is the time of your political probation. This comes at the conclusion of the Revolutionary War, when they've won. 
when they have the liberty for which they have bled. That, he says, is a time of their political probation. Not a time of enjoyment, but a time of labor. Now, it seems to me what Washington means to convey by that is that the purpose of liberty is to perform certain kinds of works. The notion of liberty, which is a capacity to do something and nothing else, as therefore an enjoyment, is an oxymoron from Washington's point of view. To say that one is free from restraint doesn't say a thing about what one is going to do in that freedom. That's why it then falls upon the individuals, incumbent upon the one thus freed, to fill in that void, to say what shall be done. And what shall be done must be in accord with certain principles of moral happiness, political happiness, philosophical propriety, as he outlined it. So that's why it's, it's incumbent, it, it imposes a duty. See, you, you find yourself in a position where you have the power to do something. When you find yourself in that position, there's nothing more important to do than to ask, what am I to do? And not only is it important, it's an obligation. Since moving randomly is, of course, utterly destructive, not to say also dangerous. But then how to answer the question, what am I to do? One answers the question in a disciplined manner, with resort to the principles and powers that shape the answer. And those principles and powers are the ones that he named. The philosophical, political, and moral lights. Those have to be consulted. They're essentially the same principles and powers that were laid out at the beginning of the spirit of the laws by the French philosopher Montesquieu, when he described the situation of the human being in nature. He said, the human being in nature has to follow the law of nature, but has to do it on his own. And how is he going to do that? Won't he forget <laughs> when he goes straight? He said, he will, but he has these three things to remind him. Effectively, the same three things that Washington named. So that sense of duty comes from the very power itself, the power of action. Most human beings in most of human history have very little power to act. They are usually constrained to act one way or the other. Most have throughout human history lived under despotism. Most human beings have had masters. They have not had to ask the question, what am I to do except in the smallest way, whether to step here or there. So, to break free from what has been the weight of human history, to discover one no longer has a master, means to impose an extraordinary burden on oneself. It's the same burden Uncle Tom discovers, discovers, he knew it, but that he expresses, that he articulates, when he's told he's going to be given his freedom, and he exults. And his master then, St. Clair, is a bit taken aback because they had a strongly bonded relationship. And St. Clair says, well, wait a minute. Are you in such a hurry to get out of here? What, what is all this about? He says, look, don't, don't make a mistake, Master. That's not it at all. It's just the idea that I can answer the question, what am I to do with recourse to my own capabilities and my own things? Of course that's what I want. And that's where the duty comes from. But to be able, then, to fulfill that duty well means to create the forms of social organization that support us in doing so. Self-government is the human obligation. Self-government, however, is impossible outside of the context of a self-governing community. There is no such thing as an isolated human being who can be properly self-governing. It has to be reinforced within the context of a self-governing community. That's why it becomes an obligation and a duty. And that's why Washington makes the argument about the relationship between liberty on the one hand and particularism on the other hand. You can't defend liberty unless you're going to defend the society that defends liberty, the free society. You can't do it. That's Washington's argument.
terms of our progress as a nation, what do you think Washington would be most proud of? And what do you think you would find most troubling? Ah. I, it's easier for me to answer what he would be most proud of looking at the sweep of our history than to answer what he would find most troubling because there's so much <laughs> to, to consider troubling. <laughs> but I, I have no hesitation to say he'd be most proud of the country and Abraham Lincoln and its resolve in addressing the question of slavery. He closed his life brooding on that question and doing what he could to convey to his people what the proper course should be, the sense of obligation. And this, is a, this also ties in with the former question because he explains, as I explained in that chapter seven that I mentioned earlier, he explained how utterly foolish and unacceptable it is for people to carry on a discourse about abolition and liberation that doesn't carry with it a discourse about responsibility. I mean, what good does it do to say to slaves you're free in the middle of a country where nobody wants them and there's nothing for them to do where they can't provide for themselves? See, he understood the insanity of that, so he accepted personally the burden of making certain that he could provide for the slaves he liberated. He had to be able to do that to liberate them, and he succeeded by the end of his life. The country, too, needed to take that lesson. That was Washington's desire. So I don't have any hesitation to say that would be what he would be most proud of, that the country did end up where he wanted to see it end up. I can't answer the second part. <laughs> yes? Considering what you said about Washington, considering himself a citizen of humanity, and maybe taking into consideration our foreign policy regarding Iraq and our alliance with Israel. What Washington said in his farewell address in terms of foreign policy seems to be inconsistent with the way America conducts her foreign policy today. And I was wondering if maybe you could elucidate clearly where the consistencies or inconsistencies lie. Well, uh, you will find a chapter in this book also that addresses that question, namely, uh, it's called the foreign policy of republicanism. And it's meant to elucidate precisely what it is the farewell address is demanding. It has often been mistaken to have prescribed no entangling alliances, which is rather a Jeffersonian position than a Washington position. Well, Washington was much clearer. He said, yes, we want to steer clear of permanent loves and permanent hatreds. There's no foreign nation that we should regard as a permanent love or a permanent hatred. But part of his reasoning for that had to do with, of course, the vulnerability of the young nation. So it was counsel of prudence in that regard that let us husband our resources and let us husband our affections sufficiently to be able to protect ourselves. More importantly than that, what he explains in the farewell address is that the United States is a different kind of country than has ever been in the world. It cannot operate the way other countries have operated. Other countries could embrace a Machiavellian foreign policy. They can give their word today and break it tomorrow. They could lie with impunity. They had a freedom unparalleled in that regard. Why? Because those who exercised the power were unchecked in the power they exercise. But in this nation, governed by public opinion, it is impossible to pursue a policy subject to such momentary shifts and transitions because you can't carry that opinion with you through such changes. The only way, therefore, to conduct a foreign policy in such a nation, according to the Farewell Address, is to do so with a strict adherence to justice. So build the expectation of justice in everything that you do and build that in the public opinion as the constraint upon government. And that is the only way you will be able to practice a successful foreign policy. That's Washington's advice. So that what you would have to do in looking at any contemporary issue is to ask first the question, is it just? 
There is no more important question in foreign policy in the United States because public opinion cannot be kept on board any other way. follow up on um, what you said about Washington thinking that Lincoln's actions as president, particularly regarding slavery, would be um, the most honorable occurrence in the history of our country. You know, living in this area now, that in Philadelphia, where Washington used to reside, mm -hmm. um, Market Street, which used to be High Street, mm -hmm. um, uh, they're excavating and building a special memorial uh, for the yes. slaves that Washington Right. had with him during the convention and so on, which is once a remembrance of the slaves who lived there and possibly also um, a condemnation of Washington having those slaves there. Um, what do you say to that? I would love to see this memorial built if it told the full story of Washington's relationship with slaves because it would actually go a long way to correct the misconceptions we have in this country. If it included, for example, the story of the a slave who was an attendant on Martha here in Philadelphia, and who towards the end of their time in the city decided to run away, and who ran away and landed somewhere in Connecticut around New Haven or something. And Martha was so distraught and wanted uh, the president to do everything in his power to return her. And the power, the president, being a dutiful husband as well as a man of principle, of course, then undertook to write associates and to explain to them the circumstances, and then to give them direction of a very particular nature. It says, if you can locate her, see if she will come back, and if she will, a sister. <laughs> That was the extent of his effort to recover the runaway slave of his wife, who dearly wanted the slave back. If that story could be fully told in the memorial, one would begin to see into George Washington's relationship with his slaves and what it meant. The mere existence of slavery does not operate as a ban upon any human being's character. That's something we need to come to understand. Most people in most of human history were born into the practice, just as we all in our own time are born into various practices. How we deal with the practices we're born into, that is the test of character, not the bare relationship. So a memorial that presents the bare relationship and says nothing about how one deals with it, how one shows one's character and relationship to it, that is a distortion of history and it's a crime against George Washington. Please join me in thanking Dr. Oh, you can't do that. We have one more. <laughs> okay, one more. Just, just one more. That's all. Go ahead, sir. This is the encore. Early on, you referenced uh, political opinion ruling the nation. But at the time, uh, specifically with history, Washington wasn't even elected by the people. He was elected by the House of Representatives. Uh, this is a wonderful question. I'm delighted we got a chance to talk about it. Now let me repeat it because you may not all have heard it completely. So is it not true that public opinion played a smaller role in Washington's time than it plays in our time? Wasn't his election an indirect election by a handful, not an election by the people? And doesn't that therefore signify that we can't credit claims to speak for public opinion on the part of George Washington and those of his time? That's just an absolutely important question. It goes to the heart for those of you who are political scientists to the way in which we practice our craft in the, in the discipline of political science. Facts. Washington was elected by the Electoral College. It wasn't in the House of Representatives. It was the Electoral College. He's the only president yet to have been unanimously elected. Now, how did that come about, and what did it mean in relationship to the people? Let's consider what happened in 1777. Do you remember what year that was? The year of Valley Forge and bloody feet in the snow. 
and many other terrible things affecting the army of the United States during the revolution.